Hello, welcome to a sepsis and sterile technique, common contaminations. Today, we're gonna to talk about the fundamental rules of a sepsis. Um, these rules allow us to recognize common contaminations in the operating room. The safety of the patient depends on strict adherence to the practice of sterile technique by the entire surgical team. We must constantly be aware of our own sterile technique as well as the technique of other members of the surgical team. The principles of sterile of asepsis, sorry, one second here. The principles of asepsis are the fundamental rules that serve as the basis of sterile technique and all practices of sterile technique can be connected to these three principles. Adherence to the principles of asepsis and practicing with sterile technique will reflect our surgical conscience and the ability to prevent surgical site infections. The, the three principles are, principle number one, a sterile field is created for each surgical procedure. The primary method by which microbes are kept to a minimum in the OR is through the creation of a sterile field for each procedure. Principle two, the sterile team members must be appropriately attired prior to entering the sterile field. The attire worn by sterile individuals include a gown, gloves, mask, hair cover, and shoe covers. Um, all of this aids in preventing surgical site infection. And principle number three, movement in and around the sterile field must not compromise the sterile field. Now let's take a look at some examples of sterile technique practices that fall under principle one. A sterile field is created for each surgical procedure. The term, if in doubt about the sterility of an item, consider it non-sterile and do not use. Um, this is, you're gonna hear this a lot in the OR, if in doubt, throw it out. If you are questioning the sterility of an item, um, and it is discussion, and it's always good to have a discussion with others about it, but if you cannot land on a concrete reason that directly goes back to a sterile per principle, then um, you're in doubt and you should throw it out. The sterile field should be created as close as possible to the time of use, and it should be monitored at all times. That means eyes have to be on that sterile field at all times. Remember, as time passes, the greater the chance for the sterile field to become contaminated, either by air or by airborne contamination. So make sure that eyes are on the field and it is done as close as possible. If a patient procedure has been delayed, a cover can be used, but it must not drop below the table. So this particular cover, this is that clear cover that's going over the top of it. This is unacceptable. That clear cover goes all the way down to the floor that's contaminated. There's no way to take that off without bringing that contaminated area above over your field. The chemical indicators must be checked to ensure the instruments have been exposed to the sterilization process. If the chemical indicators have not changed to the proper color, as you see on the top indicator here, the instruments should be considered non-sterile and they should be passed off the field and not used on the patient. Instruments and sharps such as a scalpel blade that come in contact with the skin of the patient should not be reused. The items should be returned to a designated area of the Mayo stand or back table to prevent further use in deeper tissues. So that knife, that skin knife, uh, or skin blade could be used again to for a skin incision, but should not be used on a deeper tissue. Remember that skin is not sterilized. It's, it's disinfected and it's cleaned, it's aseptic, but it is not sterilized. For clean, contaminated, and contaminated procedures, and this would be a case where the bowel is opened, as you see here, Separate setups should be used for the clean and dirty portions of the procedure. You should not reuse instruments 
used during an open bowel or dirty portion of a procedure. And you also should regown and reglove before returning to the use of the sterile instruments from the clean setup. So the setups have to be completely separate. And it can be within one procedure that you have two separate setups. The inner edge of a heat sealed pack is considered the demarcation line between sterile and non-sterile. So this right here, that heat sealed line is the line between sterile on the inside and unsterile. The flaps of the peel pack should be pulled back when opening with no tears in the pack itself. The contents should then be transferred onto the sterile field or the scrubbed uh, person should grasp only the edge of the inner contents without touching the peel pack. The contents must never be allowed to slide over the edge of the peel pack when delivering to the sterile field. Principle two. Sterile team members must be appropriately attired prior to entering the sterile field. This includes some of the following practices. The surgical gown is considered sterile in the front only, two inches below the neckline. So this is a little bit lower in this line here. So about two inches below the neckline um, to table level, which you see that's what that red line is there. Um, the upper chest area on the front of the gown is considered non-sterile because it cannot be directly viewed by the wearer and because your chin can hit. So this is what the area they're talking about here, that your chin can hit that gown. So we should not touch that area because it, it should be considered unsterile. The gown sleeves up to two inches above the elbow are considered sterile. So this whole section right here, remember your white cuffs are not. Um, so this part is all sterile. The back is unsterile. When wearing a sterile gown, the non-sterile back should not be turned towards the op operative field or the back table. So you got to be very cautious when you're turning that grab instruments or grab things that you're not putting your back towards any of that sterile field. Um, so you would never position the back table behind yourself. Uh, it should be at your side or at an angle so that you don't you don't hit it behind you. Um, let's see, hands should not be allowed to fall below table level. Um, the team members should avoid raising the hands above mid chest line. So this picture here, she's too high. And you can see why this is all unsterile here. So she's taking the chance of bumping. The, her hands should kind of rest in that sterile area. Okay. Um, now, a few exceptions. You could raise your hands like this if you are reaching for a sterile light handle or to adjust the OR lights. Um, it should be done at the beginning of the case, and you want to avoid going up in the air like that as much as possible. So you want those lights to be in a good spot from the beginning. The axilla or armpits are not sterile. Um, because it cannot be viewed. We can't see what's going on under there. And, um, you know, the odds of strike through contamination from perspiration or sweat can occur in this area. So the arms should not be folded with the hands tucked in exactly like this picture showing. Um, this is not okay. Uh, you should make sure that um, people aren't standing with their hands tucked in. Now the third principle, uh, movement in and around the sterile field uh, must not compromise the sterile field. This includes two categories. The first category is sterile to sterile and the following practices should be considered. Only sterile items and sterility, um, sterily attired individuals may enter, um, may contact sterile areas. So let me repeat that. Only sterile items and sterily attired individuals may contact sterile areas. Only sterile items may be placed within or moved within a sterile field. And contamination occurs when a sterile person touches or makes contact with a non-sterile surface or item. 
The circulator and other non-sterile personnel must not touch or come into contact with sterile surfaces or items and should never walk between two sterile areas. Um, so let's take a look at this for a sec. So we have, this is the table where the patient would be. Okay, here's our Mayo stand. Here's our back table. Now let's say that these two items are draped and we're standing right here and the patient is now draped. This would be inappropriate for the circulator to walk through this area here because you're in between two sterile items. Now, if that patient's not draped, it's okay for people to walk around because all of our sterile supplies are against the wall. But as soon as this bed gets draped, nobody should walk in between. Now, non-sterile to non-sterile practices include um, non-sterile items and individuals may only contact non-sterile items. So a non-sterile individual, like a circulator, must never extend over a sterile field to transfer sterile items to a sterile individual. Extending the hands over a sterile area could lead to contamination by skin falling or flaking, hair. Um, they just cannot, you have to keep that 12 inch rule. And speaking of which, the 12 inch rule, to avoid reaching over a sterile basin, the circulator should hold only the lip of a bottle over the sterile basin or container and should maintain a 12 to 18 inch distance above the sterile container with, uh, with, uh, while pouring. Um, sterile fluid bottles should never be recapped and reused and replacing the cap contaminates the fluids within the bottle. So it should never be used after that. This presentation has covered just a handful of the approved sterile technique practices. As you've been reading in the AST guidelines, there are many more practices um, that are listed in each one of those guidelines. Although there are a million different ways to contaminate, here are 20 common contaminations that occur often in the operating room. For this week's discussion, I would like you to select 10 of the, of the common contaminations listed here and categorize them under the three principles of asepsis. So each one of these common contaminations can be connected to one of the three principles. After you connect the 10 that you select, then I want you to choose one of these contaminations and discuss how, tell me how it, what, what, um, what principle it's connected to. And then I want you to tell us how you would possibly correct the contamination, okay? I want you to use critical thinking and think of how you would fix the situation. When you enter the OR, you will come across multiple situations that can all be connected to the three principles of asepsis. To keep our patients safe, it is crucial that you know the principles well and use critical thinking to work through any question of contamination that arises in the OR.